I'm at the Eyes on Design Car Show hosted by the Etzel and Eleanor Ford Estate located in Gross Point Shores, Michigan. It's a fundraiser, so that's classy. The cars, well, they're very classy. And the estate itself, well, <laughs> that's classy too. But I've got some ideas how we can spice this up a bit. Eyes on Design is held every year on Father's Day. And no, they didn't kick me out. It was a dad joke. It's a fundraiser for the Detroit Institute of Ophthalmology to further their work in supporting the visually impaired and research held on the grounds of the estate of Etzel and Eleanor Ford. Etzel was the only child of Henry Ford, and he lived on this estate until his death in 1943. You probably have heard of the Etzel automobile. It was intended to be its own brand, not just a one-off model, alongside Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury. But people didn't like it. I'm going to give you a taste for this show, and hopefully it encourages you to look for other car shows in your area. This show is handicap accessible, and it also provides accommodations for visually impaired people in line with the charity that hosts the event. The show attracts top designers from the auto industry, so let's start with Ralph Scheele, head of design for Fiat Chrysler and now chief design officer for Stellantis. He was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award at the show. And that, that makes him sound like an old dude, but he's not. He's just been crushing it from an early age. In support of their guy, Stellantis, the new name for Chrysler, pulled out more than a few of their pieces from their private collection for the show. I'll show you some of them later, but let's start off by drooling over one of his personal vehicles. A 1968 Dodge Charger, extensively modified by a custom shop called Speedcore and given the nickname Hallucination. It's powered by, nope, not a Hellcat engine. It's got one of the very few Hellefant 7-liter supercharged V8s, making about 1,000 horsepower. The body panels have been redone in carbon fiber, and you can see the material through the clear coat. It's absolutely crazy how the direction of the weave matches from panel to panel. They flow all in the proper direction. It's just amazing craftsmanship. Ralph wanted to build a car that looked like it was a design sketch that came alive, jumping off the paper and onto the road. I think that's a great way to describe this vehicle. The new Top Gear did a video on it. I'll put a link to that in the notes. Actually, I'll put several links in the notes about various cars in the collection that I'm going to talk about and things you may find interesting. The 2023 Eyes on Design grouped vehicles into different design revolutions, different eras of vehicles where they transform, drawing common inspiration and evolution. Italian Futurism brought two very special cars. This 1970 Lancia Bertone Stratos Zero Concept was created to persuade Lancia to do more work with Italian Nico Bertoni. It's small by modern standards, very small, but it's totally wild. The driver and passenger enter through the front windshield, which flits up. A mechanism flips forward the steering column at the same time. You can see the side windows on each side to give some semblance of outward visibility. The engine cover is a masterpiece in itself. It gives the car a delta-shaped design, bright aluminum. The engine is beautiful to look at, but it's only a modest 1.6 liter four-cylinder making about 115 horsepower. The car would clearly benefit from modern day rear view camera system, but back in the 1970, it needed a mirror mounted on top. Again, only a concept, but you can see how Italian designers fell in love with the modern futuristic wedge shape. Think Lotus Esprit by Giugiaro or the Lamborghini LP500 prototype designed by a guy who worked at Bertoni's design studio and that led to the production Lamborghini Countach. Next to it is no ordinary Corvair. Chevrolet commissioned Pininfarina and an American designer working for them to develop this concept for what a rear engine Corvair of the future could look like. But as you probably know, Chevrolet stopped production of the Corvair later in the 1960s, and now both of these beautiful Italian body cars are in a private collection.
The Corvette turns 70 this year. Happy birthday, by the way. So they had examples on display from every generation. C1 is the first Corvette starting in 1953. It started off powered by a modest blue flame. Wait, that can't be right. That's a, that's a V8 in there. The first two years of production had an inline six cylinder mated to a two speed power glide automatic transmission. Zora Arcus Duntoff and the rest of the Corvette development team knew this was inadequate. So they developed a prototype 1953 Corvette with a 265 cubic inch small block Chevrolet V8 engine and a four speed manual transmission. Here it is. It wasn't until 1955 that Chevrolet would offer a production V8 engine in Corvettes, and that was mated to a three-speed manual, or the same sad power glide automatic. Prior to the 70s, there weren't as many lawyers or lawsuits, so well-running prototypes like this one often found their way into private collections. The owner, Ron, has a completely documented history of this vehicle, and he's working with a writer to publish a book that will include photos and details from the many hand-built components that went into this one-of-a-kind Corvette. That's a picture of the book there. If I happen to see when it gets published, I'll update the link, but maybe later in 2023 around Christmas, if you want to get yourself a gift, go look on Amazon. It should be out by then. The earliest cars being shown come from the era where combustion engine, Steam power and electric all sought to become the dominant powertrain of choice. Combustion engines ultimately won out in part due to this 1912 Cadillac Model 30. This is the torpedo model, a larger option. It also featured a self-starter making it easier and safer to operate. The battery and electronics are contained in a box along the side with an electric motor under the hood. Stahl's automotive collection had some cars on display. They're another great example of the many museums and collections you can visit. So I'll put a link in the notes. Get out and support them. Car design evolved, moving away from tall, horseless carriages into sportier automobiles. For those that could afford it, V12s and V16s began to emerge. Here's a beautiful V16 Cadillac. Another museum of note is the Auburn Corps Duesenberg Museum in Auburn, Indiana. I need to get there myself too someday. I haven't got my butt out there, but everything you read about it is great. The collection is extensive and the building is pretty sweet too. Through the 1930s and up until World War II, automakers experimented with aerodynamics to give their vehicles a more modern and at times futuristic look. Case in point, this 1936 Stout Scarab. It's a streamlined Art Deco rear engine min minivan, I guess, yeah, it's a minivan, right? It predates the VW bus by over a decade. Yeah, that's a production American van that looks like a concept. Buick is given credit for the first concept car back in 1938 with the Y job. Chrysler brought out their 1941 Chrysler Thunderbolt, a concept that saw very limited production. It's one of only four cars known to have survived. LeBaron on the side, you may be familiar with that from the 80s, but at this time, LeBaron was an independent design house and coach builder that did work for many different automakers, including Chrysler, who acquired them in the 1950s. I don't recall this, but in 1993, Chrysler used the name on a concept car. And, and who knows, it seems like the perfect name for a future electric vehicle coming from Chrysler. This car is beautiful, but you know, maybe the lightning bolt on the side door is just a bit too much. After the war, car designs continued to evolve. Some cars earned the bathtub name, as in it looks like a bathtub flipped upside down. I thought this was cool, a 1950 Nash Ambassador. The owner, John, said that executives from the company were frugal and did not want people wasting money on hotels when they could just as easily sleep in their car. This sleeper option included screens that could be fitted on the side windows. It helps to reflect the sun, allow for some air to flow through without bugs getting inside. Looks really comfortable. or absolutely frightening if your teenager asked to borrow the car for a date one night.
continuing to jump around, show cars you can drive. GM brought out their Jet Age Firebird concepts, which traveled the country as part of their Motorama promotional tours in the 1950s. Clearly, their designs were inspired by jet aircraft, and they were also powered by gas turbine engines. However, it was Chrysler who first turned heads with its forward look in the 1950s, characterized by sharp forward-leaning front ends and large rear tail fins. It was design language that caught the attention of many of its competitors as they rolled out of the assembly plants. American luxury in the 1960s. It's not the first time I've seen an Oldsmobile Toronado, but I never really appreciated just how long the front end in proportion to the steeply sloped rear. This car show was definitely geared towards Chrysler products and more American than usual, but they did pay tribute to Porsche with its rear engine revolution lineup. There were some European sports cars. This 1961 Maserati Vignale Spider really caught my eye. I skipped over the motorcycles. I skipped over the lineup of current and upcoming electric vehicles as part of their design evolution series. If you've watched any of my other videos, you'll know that I love EVs. The transition to electric mobility is disruptive from a business standpoint and fascinating from a technology standpoint. In the next 10 years, cars will change more than they have over the past previous 50 years. Just because I love EVs doesn't mean I don't love a good engine. And that's, that's I know that's like a double negative. So I, I'm saying like I, I love EVs and I also love car engines too. So that's, that's what I'm trying to say. I'll end this video with a special collection of three Can-Am race cars from Shadow Racing. Can-Am Racing at the end of the 60s and into the early 70s was a anything goes kind of an event that led to some pretty radical engineering. The black MK1 concept has a speed break on the rear that would deploy to slow the vehicle down. The red MK1 race car has radiators integrated into the rear wing, which, you know, that's it's either genius or absolutely stupid. I, I, I can't decide the pros and cons. All right, time to fire up the engines. Video, thanks for watching. I said, I said thank you for watching. It's great.